Hey everybody, so this is video three of four in the recapping pieces that we didn't get to spend a whole lot of time on uh, from the Toynbull Cooley uh, series. As you can tell, this is a re-record. Um, it's a different time of day. <laughs> I'm wearing a totally different outfit. I tried several times on video three of four. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about charioteers and the role of charioteers in the Toynbull Cooley and in prehistoric Ireland to give you a little bit of, co little bit of context. Um, because we do see charioteers coming up again and again and again in this story, um, and it's probably useful to you to have a sense of why these folks are so important and, you know, the role that they played. So, because uh, you'll notice they're not NPCs, right? Like, they get names and they get speaking parts and all of that stuff. So, like, for example, Isla sends his charioteer to go spy on Fergus and Maeve and, like, the charioteer on his own initiative, so he doesn't have to be directed, on his own initiative decides to swipe Fergus's sword and Isla is very pleased with them. And um, there are a number of exchanges between Cajun and his charioteer and, the, like, those are some of the places where we actually get to see Cajun acting as a personality and sort of an individual as opposed to just like just the war hero. Um, and all of that is significant. So um, the thing to know about sort of the background on charioteers is that it's a position of great honor and prestige because it's also, also a position of, well, it's a position that requires a lot of competence in the first place, a lot of prowess and a lot of skill. And it's a position that requires a great deal of trust and responsibility as well. Um, there were two basic types of chariot in prehistoric Ireland, maybe a third kind of intermediary type, but mostly two types. The first one is the racing chariot that we saw in uh, that first sequence that we read with a woman like races the horses and then like gives birth at the finish line and stuff. Racing chariots are like racing cars. They're built to be very fast and lightweight and, you know, like you strip down everything that you can and so that they will just virtually fly down the field. Um, and typically a race chariot might carry only one person, the driver. Um, a war chariot, by contrast, is like, if, if a racing chariot is like a racing car, then a war chariot is like a Humvee or a tank, okay? It's bigger, it's heavier, um, it might be built out of heavier types of wood, denser types of wood, or it might be built out of thicker pieces of wood, or both. Um, it's more likely to have a greater amount of metal detailing, uh, sort of strengthening um, the front piece and the, around the rim, so that it might turn back um, weapons, you know, blunt them or kind of cause the blows to glance aside. War chariots would very often also have uh, scythes, that's spelled S Y. No, sorry, S-C-Y-T-H-E. So a scythe is sort of this curved knife blade kind of thing. They would have scythes um, coming, sort of attached to the outside of the wheel rims so that when a war chariot hits the enemy line, it literally slices through. Like it, I mean, it's like a food processor or anything else with a rotating blade, you know, um, a bunch of rotating blades in this case. Um, and so because they are heavier, they're also like really hard to stop in a hurry, really hard to turn in a hurry. They would be pulled by anywhere from two to six horses. I don't think I've ever seen a mention of a chariot pulled by more than six horses. Theoretically, you could yoke as many as you want, but there's a point of diminishing your turns, right? Because you have to also manage all of these horses and get them running together. Um, well up into the modern period, saying that you had Irish horses was serious bragging rights in Europe. Um, the Irish bred, their, like the Irish famously bred really good horses, uh, very fast, very agile, very like lots of stamina, all that stuff. Um, like the noble lineages of Irish horses are all, in and of themselves famous. Um, like not just the royalty, royal people, but also the royal horses. So anyway, there's, there's this whole setup here where like the horses that carry the chariots are themselves important uh, parts of the puzzle here. And um, if you, you can kind of imagine if you are a noble warrior, because the warriors were all kind of nobles. Uh, I started to say noble men, but actually not all men. Um, we see Maeve fighting in the Toynbo Cooley, and she was not unique in that. Uh, one of the most famous Celtic fighters, not in Ireland, but in Great Britain, but there's a lot of cultural similarity there. Uh, one of the most famous Celtic fighters was Boudicca, 
and she beat the Romans like a bunch of times. They were, the Romans were really kind of upset about getting their asses handed to them by a girl, but she did it really well. Uh, she, they eventually did bring her down, but it took a while, and she did indeed drive a chariot and all that stuff. But a war chariot would also potentially carry more people than a racing chariot. So you've got, at a minimum, the warrior, the noble warrior, and the charioteer. Because if you are driving the chariot, you don't have, like, hands and thoughts free for weapons and fighting and all of that stuff. Driving the chariot is really all that you can do in that situation. Um, and then there might be a third person kind of standing to the, usually to the rear left of the warrior, and that would be, like, the shield bearer or armor bearer. Uh, you might have, like, that third person carrying backup gear and that kind of stuff for the warrior. Um, so if you're thinking about, like, driving a chariot into battle and you're the noble warrior, you have a conversation with your charioteer before you start out, of course. Like, what's the game plan? But on the field of battle, everything moves at the speed of galloping horses. If you've got six horses harnessed to this chariot that is, like, a, in and of itself a weapon and you are hurtling down the field and the enemy does something that you were not expecting and didn't plan for, there's really no time to confer and, like, make a choice, you know, like, in dialogue with your charioteer about what to do. You have to accept and expect and respect that the charioteer is going to make a call that makes sense, that is going to fulfill your goals without your direction, right? Like, the charioteer acts, you know, the, the reflexes have to be like a fighter pilot's, right? Like, instant, almost instantaneous. And um, so, like, you have to trust that the charioteer is going to make the right call day in, day out, and save your life and his, and because it is almost always a, a he with charioteers, and, you know, carry the day. That's a tremendous position of responsibility, right? Like, you have to trust the charioteer's competence to, like, know what they're doing with the horses. You have to trust their prowess, like their physical strength, um, I think that's, like, we see women on the field of battle in the Toyn and in other Celtic instances. I can't actually recall a female charioteer, and I suspect maybe the reason has less to do with um, the role of women in battle, because we are already seeing them fight, and maybe more to do with the fact that, on average, right, like, there are definitely, uh, like, it's a range, right, like, there's a kind of a bell curve here, but in general, most women are physically smaller and don't have quite as much upper body strength as most men. I mean, I am personally pound for pound as at least as strong as any of the guys that I know, but I don't have as many pounds, <laughs> so I don't have as much to work with, you know, like in total poundage, I just don't have as much. Um, and it's kind of that situation, so like, definitely not all guys are qualified to be charioteers either, but you have like a greater pool, a greater pool to pull from in terms of like that upper body strength. So the the um, the charioteers all had to be at this one end of the bell curve where you've got a lot of uh, burly sort of upper body strength. Um, but anyway, so these guys are like you've got to trust their judgment as well as their prowess, like their physical strength and their skill with the horses and all of that stuff. And that also means, like, as we see with Cahun and Ailil and their charioteers, that also means that a charioteer is a confidant of, like, the, the, the noble warrior caste, right? Like, they, they serve that role of day-to-day, um, day, day in, day out. Uh, they're always there, and um, they're sort of a sounding board or a touchstone. Like, this, this is their go-to, like... When you don't have anybody to talk to, who can you talk to? You can talk to your char charioteer. I should have said, whom can you talk to? But, um, and the other people who feel f also fulfill a role that is, like, they are in service to someone, but it isn't really, like, a, it's not a menial labor kind of role. Uh, the other role that's kind of like that in the Toyn is the role of messenger. So we've got McGrath, and similarly to all of the charioteers that we kind of see interacting, um, he is valued not just for the fact that he can run really fast, so in his case the physical prowess isn't like hauling on a team of horses, but rather he's speedy on his feet. Um, I think at one point the text says he can cover, circle all of Ireland in a day, which is a lot. Um, but like, so he's efficient at getting places to carry the message, and he does, like, we see him deliver messages, but he is also entrusted with negotiations. So, like, 
um, depending on what he finds when he gets there to deliver the message, he, he can make a judgment call about like, well, do we offer a little bit more? Like he, he reads the situation and responds in the moment accordingly without the benefit of having Maeve or Ilil there to direct him. Um, we also see him act as a scout. So he scouts around and watches what the Connacht army is doing and he reports back. But he doesn't just like report, okay, this is what I saw. He also gives sort of running commentary and analysis on that. And at different points in the toy, we also see Maven Al seek his um, counsel, seek his advice, seek his input on stuff that doesn't seem like it's immediately related to his particular job as messenger. Um, and that kind of goes hand in hand with the same sort of setup with charioteers in that this is a very trusted member of the royal household and like yes he has like he is in a servant servant role in the sense that he is in the service of Maver and Ilo but it's not servitude in the sense of like menial labor like he's not out there cleaning the, the latrines although I don't know maybe he also does that right um it's very much um like he is himself a high status individual in this society so are the charioteers and then all of that kind of gives, I hope, a little bit of context for what we are seeing on the pages um, and how we are understanding these social relationships. It, gender is one that we've talked about a lot in some, in some senses because gender is configured very, very differently in the Toyn from how we see it in the Iliad, right? Um, it's really hard to imagine uh, Brisset saying any of Maeve's lines, right? Um, even with um, Cassandra, you don't see her saying the same kinds of things as Fidelum. It's differently constructed. Um, but also, there's a their class is also constructed quite differently in the Toyn from how it is in uh, the Iliad. And so it's not just, like, we've been looking at social categories and constructs and how people in these societies imagined their relations to one another, sort of as in this sort of... Um, networked sense, like everybody's part of a social fabric. Those roles are configured quite differently in the toying, not just with gender, but with class and with sort of like what a hero, how do you imagine a hero? How do you recognize one from what we see in the Iliad? Um, and so all of that is kind of significant and I hope useful to think about. Um, I feel like there, oh, the only other thing that I wanted to say is the Greeks also had to have some charioteers because Similarly, you can't plausibly drive a chariot in ancient Greece while also fighting. Uh, like, they're, like, the physical limitations are kind of similar. Um, and yet we don't really see the same level of interaction between Achilles and anybody driving a chariot that we do between Cajun and his charioteer and confidant. Um, we just don't see these people represented, like they're, they are NPCs in the Iliad, and the Iliad has a bunch of them, versus in the Toyn, where we get like seemingly minor roles, get speaking parts and names, and like they are present on the page, they come to life in a way, um, as individuals that we don't see for almost anybody except for our like big picture leads in the Iliad. This video is getting kind of long, and also I have to go teach your class. So I'm going to wrap up here, but if you have questions later, I would love to hear them. So take care.